According to the overall scheme of South American chronology, the late horizon begins in A.D. 1476, about the point that the Inca Empire reached its maximum size. This week, to complete our examination of South American archaeology, we'll look at the Inca Empire and how it defined an Andean civilization in the late horizon. As with the Aztecs in Mexico, we know much more about Inca civilization than other South American cultures because it was still in its full flower when Spanish explorers arrived in the 16th century. Not long after Cortes had established Spanish control over the Aztecs in central Mexico, other Spanish explorers began sailing down the west coast of Mesoamerica in search of the next great conquest. While there were several important explorers active in the 1520s and 30s, the one usually credited with subduing the Incas was Francisco Pizarro, who landed in the Peruvian coast with 260 conquistadors in 1532. Unbeknownst to him, or any Westerner really, this was not the first encounter between the South American populations in the West. Several years before, smallpox had swept southward through Mesoamerica and Central America, bringing with it disease and death unlike any that had ever been known before. By some estimates, in the decade or so prior to Pizarro's landing, two-thirds of the Andean population had died in a series of epidemics. The Inca Empire was perhaps a bit more than a hundred years old when smallpox first hit, and as it swept southward along the South American coast, it struck the northern borders of the empire first, where one of the first casualties was Huayna Capac, the emperor. With him gone, suddenly and seemingly as the result of the god's wrath, the empire plunged into five years of civil war. Huayna Capac's two sons, Huascar and Atahualpa, fought a bloody conflict that drained the empire and wearied its citizens. On the eve of Pizarro's arrival, Atahualpa had essentially won the war, but had not yet cemented his victory. This is perhaps why he chose to accept Pizarro's invitation to meet. Atahualpa felt victorious and therefore confident, but not so much that he could afford to ignore a potential ally. Unfortunately, Pizarro had no intentions of allying himself with Atahualpa. He seized the emperor, ransomed him back to the Incas for a fortune of gold and silver, and then executed him anyway. This had two effects. First, Atahualpa's supporters were horrified and temporarily paralyzed by indecision. And second, Huascar's defeated faction rallied to Pizarro's side against the imperial armies. Within a short time, Pizarro and his handful of men had subdued the entire empire. This accomplishment was even more impressive than Cortes's earlier conquest of the Aztecs. Compared to the Inca, the Aztec Empire was rather small and unimpressive. At the time of the Spanish conquest, the Inca Empire was the largest nation-state on earth. It was by far the largest native state to arise in the New World, and the largest ever in the Southern Hemisphere. From its northern borders in modern Ecuador to the southern marches in Chile, it stretched over 5,500 kilometers and encompassed every ecological and cultural zone in Andean South America. The Inca themselves referred to their empire as Tahuantasuyu, the land of the four quarters, in reference to the four major administrative districts of the empire, all of them intersecting at the imperial capital of Cusco, which was at the time one of the major urban regions in the world. Today, we refer to Tahuantasuyu as the Inca Empire, but that is a me misleading title. In fact, the empire incorporated thousands of ethnic groups, both small and large, throughout the Andes, and the Inca were only one small group. The 40,000 or so people to belong to the Inca ethnic group made up the ruling class of the empire, filling all the major bureaucratic positions and residing primarily in Cusco and its immediate environs. But outside of Cusco, the land of the Four Quarters boasted a population of perhaps as many as 12 million. These non-Inca had been incorporated into the empire in a variety of ways, through conquest, through voluntary affiliation, occasionally as clients allowed to a certain degree of self-rule. The empire was divided into about 80 official provinces, each with its own bureaucracy and usually an Inca governor. Of course, those provinces were then gathered into the four quarters of the empire's name. 
The stunning degree of ethnic diversity subsumed under the Tahuantinsuyu administrative apparatus meant that actually consolidating Inca rule and establishing a lasting, stable government was extremely difficult. Imperial policy attempted to accomplish this in several ways. First, Quechua, the Inca's own language, was the official language of the empire, and official business was always conducted in it. Second, local nobles were often required to live in or around Cuzco for varying lengths of time to accustom them to Inca ways of life. Also, in places where ethnic tensions seemed likely to create problems, whole groups of people were forced to relocate to other regions of the empire. Troublesome ethnic groups were broken up and scattered, and loyal groups were moved into those regions. These colonists, called Mitamak, were seen as doing their duty to the empire. Finally, the entire empire, all 5,500 kilometers of it, was tied together by what was, at the time, the best road system in the world, with roads stretching across 30 to 40,000 kilometers of the Andes. And all of this took place in a setting with no written record. South American civilizations, much like North American, never developed writing. The only record-keeping system used in the empire was kipu, a series of knotted cords with each knot's location and style communicating specific information. Very few individuals could read kipu, and the knowledge was lost quickly following the Spanish conquest. Considering the staggering scale of the Inca Empire, it's even more difficult to understand how a few hundred Spaniards could subdue the entire realm. It's harder still to imagine how a few thousand Inca could create such an empire in the few short generations before Pizarro. The Inca themselves scrupulously maintained imperial histories to explain just that. The problem is that Inca histories, first and foremost, served as Inca propaganda. It's clear that the Inca themselves freely modified and revised their histories to better reflect their sense of the world. So while we shouldn't accept these tales uncritically, they can certainly tell us something about how the Inca elite saw themselves and their role in the universe. Inca histories begin with Viracocha, the creator of the universe, whom the Inca equated with the old Tiwanaku gateway god, creating humans at the site of Tiwanaku, which the Inca considered a sacred city. Having created the human race, Viracocha sent humans out into the world to their appointed homelands. One of these first humans, Manco Capac, traveled north and ultimately founded Cusco to become the first Inca king. For many generations, Inca tradition tells us, the Inca themselves remained a relatively small tribe surrounded by barbarians. Eventually, Pachacuti, the ninth Inca king, turned outward against the barbarian enemies and began building an empire. After many successes in the central Andes, Pachacuti re retired from warfare and returned to Cusco to rebuild the city as his imperial capital. When Pachacuti died, his son Topa Inca ascended to the throne. By the end of his reign, the empire had reached almost its full extent. Topa Inca was succeeded by his unfortunate son, Huayna Capac, who focused on strengthening Inca rule and spreading the Inca way of life, up until his death from smallpox and the start of his son's civil war. What this official history tells us about Inca worldview is twofold. First, the Inca believed that their people had created the concept of civilization, and that it was their duty to spread that civilization to the rest of the world. Second, they believed that civilization itself was a very new concept, only having been around for a few generations. Both ideas supported the Inca policy of expansion through military conquest, as no one could object to the civilizing of barbarians with no history of their own. Of course, as we've seen, the history of the Andes is actually extremely deep and varied, and the mountains and deserts are literally covered with signs of past civilizations. The official Inca histories acknowledged the pre-existence of Tiwanaku, which they attributed to a primordial race of giants, and the great religious center of Pachacamac on the coast. They also begrudgingly admitted to the pre-existence of Chimor and its capital Chanchan, though they preferred not to talk about the accomplishments of their rivals. 
Thanks to a century of archaeology in the Andes, we now know that these histories are not 100% trustworthy. For example, we know that Inca culture per se did not suddenly explode on the scene during Pachacuti's reign. Inca cultural development began centuries before during the early part of the late intermediate period, with the Quilque and Lucre styles. Cusco did not remain an isolated city-state either, as it was clearly the dominant force in the Inca's central Andes homeland by about 1200. And the early phase of expansion appears not to have been military, but primarily peaceful and persuasive, as people in the adjoining valleys and mountains chose to align themselves with Cusco. On the other hand, around the middle part of the 15th century, the time of the historical Pachacuti, Cusco did undergo a major rebuilding program and did take on the guise of an imperial capital. This also happens to be right around the time that the centuries-long drought was breaking, and this improved environment probably drove Pachacuti and Topa Inca's wars of expansion, which culminated in Topa Inca's destruction of Chan Chan in 1470. So while the idea that the Inca created Andean civilization and took it to the rest of the world just isn't true, it is true that the rest of the Andes had only experienced a few generations of Inca rule when Pizarro arrived to end it. This may not have been enough time for many of the hundreds of small ethnic groups to undergo much Incaization. On the other hand, there's good reason to believe that many Andean societies had shared broad patterns of belief and organization with one another for thousands of years. We know quite a bit about the social and cultural practices of the Inca and their subjects thanks to the meticulous record-keeping and curiosity of Spanish colonials. The basic Andean belief system that predominated in the Inca Empire described a cosmos that was very animated and vital. Humans lived in a landscape infused with the sacred, worshipping a combination of anthropomorphic deities and huacas, the Quechua word for prominent landscape features with sacred significance. Huacas could be man-made, as was the Huaca del Sol of the Moche, but more often they were natural features, including massive apu, or sacred mountains. The landscape was also seen as the body of Pachamama, or Mother Earth, who was the most important deity for the agricultural populace. Wakas were not particularly personified by their worshippers, but the Inca pantheon included many anthropomorphic deities who, in myths, acted essentially as human beings. For the Inca, the most important of these was Inti, the sun god who served as a special patron deity of the Inca themselves, much as Huitzilopochtli was a patron of the Aztecs. Viracocha was the creator of the universe, but seen as more distant and less involved in daily affairs. Other important deities were Mamakilia, the goddess of the moon, Iyapa, a storm god, and Pachacamac, the god of the earthquakes and prophecy, whose cult was centered in the great coastal city of Pachacamac and predated the Inca themselves. Socially, the Inca empire was extremely complex, incorporating many small ethnic groups, each with its own traditions and organizations. Almost all of them shared a common base, however, with the Ayu. The Ayu was the basic unit of social action in the empire, the grouping of people that one associated with on a daily basis to make a living. It was an autonomous, self-sufficient, land-owning organization of related individuals, or individuals assumed to be related. Smaller Ayu could trace all the relevant genealogical relationships from any member to any other, but larger such groupings simply assumed a relationship must exist. The Ayu thus matches very well the anthropological concept of a clan or a lineage. Members of an Ayu were always understood to be the descendants of a single common ancestor. For larger Ayu, this ancestor was often mythical, a Huaca or Apu near the Ayu's land. Sometimes, for small Ayu, the ancestor was an actual person whose mummy, called a Malki, was retained and cared for by Malki Paviak, special priestly attendants who wielded significant power because they spoke for the ancestors. The Ayu collectively owned and worked land. It was governed by a subset of Ayu members known as Curacas, or nobles. All Ayu members were expected to take other members as spouses, a practice known as endogamy, or marriage within the group. 
Caracas were not only expected to marry other members of the IU, but also other Caracas. It was the noble class that set policy for the IU and made decisions. The rest of the IU were tasked with carrying out those decisions. Every IU was divided into two moieties. Moieties were exogamous. One had to marry a member of the other moiety. Each moiety in turn was divided into two suyu, and each suyu into several small lineages. All of these groupings were ranked hierarchically with the order determined by genealogy. Suyu descending from older sons were superior to those descending from younger sons, for example. Everyone knew his position in the hierarchy of the Ayu because everyone knew his kinship relationships with everyone else. As I've said, everyone was expected to marry a member of the opposite moiety. Upon marriage, the wife would move out of her parents' home and into the home of her husband, what anthropologists call patrilocal residence. Children belonged to the lineage of their father, that is, descent was patrilineal. Here, it's important to note that Mosley says that only boys belong to their father's lineage, while girls trace their family through the mother's line. I can find no other source that corroborates that pattern, and if it were true, it would be exceedingly rare, perhaps unique, among world cultures. The weight of evidence suggests that the Inca were patrilineal. Economically speaking, the IU cooperated to produce food and goods for its own consumption or for trade with other IU. The basic economic relationship was one of reciprocity and sharing within the group, with everyone taking on different but complementary roles for the benefit of the group as a whole. In agricultural areas, this meant cooperative farming. In the great crafting city of Chan Chan, this meant specializing in particular crafts for trade. It was this principle of reciprocity and cooperation that was adapted by the Inca government to form the economic policy of the empire. Imperial economic activities can be broadly divided into two categories, income and expenditures. Income is comprised of taxes and tributes paid by the citizens to the empire and fell into three subcategories. First, taxes were paid in the form of foodstuffs produced on agricultural land. One-third of the produce went to support temples and priesthoods, one-third to the support of the imperial bureaucracy, and one-third to the support of the people themselves. Finally made textiles made up the second kind of taxation. At the time of contact, textiles were used very similarly to money in the empire. Imperial bureaucrats, traders, and other skilled craftsmen would be paid for their work in textiles made by the people and given to the government as taxes. Finally, perhaps most importantly, taxes were levied in the form of labor, also known as corvée. The Quechua term for this labor was mita, and every able-bodied man was expected to devote a portion of his year to laboring for the empire. This could be in the form of military service, but more often it took the form of construction work on public infrastructure, terracing the mountainsides, digging and maintaining irrigation systems, or building the empire's highways. Imperial expenditures were where the empire returned these taxes to its citizens. Most of the largest expenditures were on infrastructure and construction, but much also went to the support of the imperial bureaucracy. About 10% of the population was under full-time support from the government, either as bureaucrats themselves or as skilled craftsmen and artists and engineers working to support the nobility. These individuals received two kinds of compensation staple finance, that is food, and wealth finance, or valuable goods. Both kinds of finance originated ultimately with citizens' taxation. Finally, I'd like to take a brief moment to look at the capital city of Cusco, since it was understood by the Inca themselves to be the model on which the empire was built. We know archaeologically, of course, that Cusco was founded in the 12th century as the local Quilque and Lucre populations began to merge into the Inca. Because the Inca's sense of their own uniqueness, the city never grew to be very large by Andean standards. When Pizarro arrived, it had maybe 40,000 inhabitants, the ethnic Inca themselves. The mountain valleys surrounding Cusco, however, were spotted with large suburbs, so that the entire area had perhaps 200,000 inhabitants. 
certainly the largest urbanized area in the New World at the time. Tradition tells us that Pachacuti began remodeling Cusco in the middle part of the 15th century, turning it from a minor city into an impressive imperial capital. Indeed, much of the most impressive architecture of the city dates to about that time. The Sacsayhuaman, Cusco's great fortress, dates earlier, but its massive walls were rebuilt around this time in the intricate polygonal style of Cusco, where each solid stone block is a unique shape. The seat of the imperial government was centered on the Huacaypata, a massive central plaza and administrative complex. These buildings were built of ashlars, regular rectangular stone blocks, in contrast to the sacred architecture of the Sacsayhuaman. Residential districts of Cusco were made up of conchas, walled residential compounds, the largest of which could be called palaces. Each wealthy and powerful family had its own concha, and these were grouped into two moiety districts, reflecting that the Inca ethnic group constituted its own ayu. In fact, despite the baffling complexity of Tahuantasuyu, the Inca never lost their basic ayu organization. As most ayu were governed by a pair of Curaca nobles, one from each moiety, some have even suggested that the empire functioned as a diarchy, with two co-regent emperors. According to this theory, Spanish colonial authorities simply misunderstood Inca government because their own experiences had only been with monarchies. It's certainly true that other aspects of Cusco seem fanciful or mistaken, such as the tradition that Pachacuti laid out the city to resemble a giant puma effigy. I certainly can't see a puma in that map. So, as we've seen several times before this semester, the civilization of the Inca Empire was unique unto itself, the product of its own history and developmental trajectory. But the empire, and all of Andean civilization, still followed many of the same broad trends we saw in North and Mesoamerica as well. Small, isolated cultures with different adaptations to the environment, slowly growing more and more interconnected with one another, sharing ideas and trading new developments with one another, until eventually the whole region is dominated by one cultural tradition. What were, on the surface, very different cultures, in fact turned out to be rather similar when viewed carefully. That perhaps is the lesson of archaeology. No matter how different our cultures seem to be, we all remain, at the base, humans. Thank you, and I hope you learned something.